Greetings and welcome. We are in junior English. And our objective now for the hour is to talk with one of America's classic writers, Stephen Crane. We're going to be with you on page 506, 507 of your hymnal. I hope that you're there. I hope that you have your annotation pages out as well. And we now are going to make a couple of observations about Crane, particularly as we get ready for this project of reading An Episode of War is the title of the short story we're going to be working with. Your anthology makers have a challenge. They know that if they are going to have a collection of writings about American literature, that sooner or later they're going to have to talk about Stephen Crane. Here's why. Stephen Crane writes one of the most famous novellas, or novels, short novels, in the history of American literature, and we want to write it down right now at 3A, and that is the title, Red Badge of Courage. We want to write that down at 3A. Red Badge of Courage. Let's briefly talk about this novel, or novella, because it will play a significant role in the history of American thought about the American Civil War. Crane did not actually see battles during the American Civil War. However, he publishes, after the war, a short novella called Red Badge of Courage. We are told a number of interesting things about these battles, and so we want to take a few moments to just outline. We find out that in the battles themselves, outlined in an earlier lecture, but I'll review, you would walk out into an area to fight the battle. There would be several lines of soldiers. They all had rifles. These rifles, however, would be loaded individually with each separate ball projectile of metal from the bullet. You had to pour gunpowder down the barrel. You had to go through a process of actually pounding or packing this all together, and then you would raise your firearm and you would shoot. Lines would be made that couldn't be that far apart because the weapons were not that accurate. And so you usually stood the distance from these two walls to each other. Okay? And the first line would step up and would shoot at the line on the other side. Then that line would back up and begin to reload as the second line would then step forward. You had three, sometimes more, of these lines or bodies of soldiers. In the firing of the weapon, smoke inevitably was going to be a byproduct because of the gunpowder and the nature of the exchange when the hammer hit, okay, once you pull the trigger. So smoke very quickly would become a part of these battles. So much smoke, if several hundred guys were fighting, that very quickly you could not see very well. Once you ran out of projectiles, bullets, the only thing left for you in regards to fighting was to fight with the very weapon of the firearm itself. A bayonet or a knife, long knife, set at the front of the weapon, and you literally just ran and tried to stab people with that weapon, or you could bludgeon people with the end of your rifle. That was all that was left. Because of the nature of the smoke, friendly fire, people killing each other from the same side, happens all the time in these battles. Question. How do you know when your side has lost or won the battle? Answer. You look up. Both sides will have a standard bearer, a long pole, at the top of it, a flag. If you can see the flag, you know your side is still in the fight. If you cannot see the flag, you know your side most likely has lost. Someone has to stand and hold that flag, that pole. That's one person whose job it is given to hold the flag in the front of the group. Are you ready for this? He does not have a firearm. His job is not to shoot. His job is to stand and hold this flag up. So that everybody on your side can look up, see the flag, and know you're still in the battle. 
So where will a lot of the bullets be shot from the other side? Right. Right away, if you can kill the guy holding the, the flag, the flag's going to fall over. Guys will look up in the smoke, not see their flag, assume that the battle is lost, turn and run. So you got a question. When the flag man who is holding the flag is shot and the flag starts to fall over, someone has to drop his firearm, grab the pole, and now stand it back up. And this will go on through the battle until finally nobody can hold the flag up anymore. It gives new meaning to the childhood game, Capture the Flag. Do you agree with me? The origination of the idea, of course, comes in battles such as the ones fought in the American Civil War. Red Badge of Courage is a story about a young boy who wants to go and fight and be a hero in the war. So he's very young. Basically, he's the age of the young men in our room now. Off he goes to the battle to fight. He is convinced because he's read great poems about war, like Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey, that when he gets into the fight, he's going to be really brave. Problem. When he finally gets into the battle and the bullets all start whizzing around him, he immediately says to himself, this is insane, I don't need to be here, I need to be back on my home, back on my farm, back at home. And he turns around and he starts running. And he runs to get away, and he runs right into a tree branch that hits him right across the head, lays open his forehead really badly, and knocks him out. When he comes to, the battle is over. He gets up, he has a terrible headache, blood everywhere, stumbles into camp. Two things. One, they've won. They've won the battle. Two, they look at his head and they go, dude, you got shot and you survived. You are a hero. And he goes, yes I am, yes I am. But the longer people call him a hero, the more it bugs him that nobody really knows who he is and what he did. And so he waits to wonder if he will actually ever have his chance to gain his red badge of courage. At the end of the short novella, sure enough, his opportunity comes. And in the middle of a terrible fight, he sees the flag ready to fall, drops his weapon, and grabs the pole himself. And in the process, proclaiming his courage. Now, for those of us who know anything about the significance of photographs and statues, you are probably familiar with that very famous image of those Marines holding that flag up on the sands of Iwo Jima that got turned into a major sculpture in our nation's capital, the Washington, D.C. Uh, Monument District. You can today go and see that. The idea of holding a flag up so that it doesn't hit the ground has everything to do with why when the national anthem gets played before ball games, they will ask you to remove your ball cap and put your hand over your heart. See, this takes us back in time all the way back to the novel of Crades, Red Badge of Courage, to say we easily forget just what it means when we talk about the battles of the four years of the American Civil War. Let me give you one example of what we're talking about as we go forward. I'd like to, for a moment with you on page 508, I'd like to read the background information and just do some quick mathematics. Now, here's, our, here's a problem that I point out often to my students. We go to history class, we do the worksheets, and for some reason it never actually computes in our brain. Let me give you one example of that. Are you reading with me under background on page 508? Until World War II, are you reading with me on page 508, background? Until World War II, the American Civil War was the bloodiest conflict in American history. It claimed the lives of 600,000 soldiers. I'd write that number down real quick. Let's do some mathematics to blow our mind. And because we can read a figure like that and it not mean anything to us, now that you have 600,000 written down, 
I'd like to ask you to do some quick mathematics this way. You live in a town of 5,000 people. 5,000. You just read that in four years, 600,000 men died. How many Warlands, if Warland is 5,000 people, how many Warlands died in four years? You do the mathematics. It isn't very difficult, is it? But it's enough for you to say, whoa, there's a number of Warlands completely dead. The number of lives lost in the American Civil War, though, are nothing. That's only one statistic. The statistic that this story is going to emphasize is the statistic of the number who died once they were wounded. You want to write this down. Once they were wounded. And here's why. Once you got wounded, you didn't have often a really good hospital to take care of you. Keep reading with me. Hundreds of thousands more were left maimed by battle wounds and crude medical care. In fact, conditions in field hospitals were so primitive. Are you ready for this stat? I put it in my notes. I hope you're reading it with me. Twice as many soldiers died from infection as from combat wounds. As you read this story, keep in mind that amputation was the routine treatment for injured Limbs. A wounded soldier knew that he faced the high probability of losing his arm or leg to a surgeon's saw. What? Saw? What are you talking about? You have an image that's a powerful one there on page 508. You have another image on page 511. I hope that you're flipping through. You have an image on page 512. This is an actual picture on page 512 of what a surgery in a field hospital might look like. Do you see on page 5, I'm sorry, I'm going to gross some of you out and I apologize, but i got to point this out to you. See, I find it odd that sometimes students just don't know certain things. Look on page 513. Page 513. That, on page 513, that is the medical kit for a Civil War doctor. Go ahead and look at it close. I need you to see it close because I need you to see what's at the very bottom of the kit. What's the thing at the very bottom of that surgeon's kit? That is a saw. And that saw was used time and again to remove a body part if it had been wounded. They did not have time often to go in and try to extract the bullet. So if you were shot, for example, in the arm, they would simply just take the arm off, just saw it off. Whitman will write, having been an eyewitness of this, Walt Whitman will write in drum taps and elsewhere about going to the field hospitals and seeing mounds of amputated limbs that were taller than his head of the limbs that after they get sawed off, they just get kind of thrown in one of these mounds. Provocative. What Crane is going to do is tell us a story that will be rooted in at 2B naturalism. Naturalism. I'm with you on page 506. I hope you go there. Page 506. And if you are at page 506 for 2B, go ahead and write it down now. I want you to write down this word naturalism. And then let's define it. A literary movement that developed in reaction to romanticism. The horrors of the Civil War caused many American writers to question romantic ideals about human goodness and nature's beauty. In stark contrast to the romantic view, naturalists, here's your definition, you'll want to write it down, felt that people's lives are controlled by forces beyond their understanding or control. These forces include heredity, people's surroundings, sheer chance. In naturalistic works, characters are often victims of their own instincts or of a violent world and they endure their suffering with a quiet dignity. If romanticism says the world is a great place, Naturalism says the world is not a great place at all. The world is a nasty place with lots of terrible things that can happen. The story, an episode of war, 
is going to unsettle one or two of you. I'll tell you this in advance. It is not a happy story. It is the story, brief story, of a man in the Civil War who is wounded. And the moment he is wounded, he knows terrible things potentially coming for him. As we look at then this story, let's go ahead now and begin on page 509 at level 1 by simply summarizing as we read the events as they unfold. An episode of war. Stephen Crane's classic. Here we go. An episode of war. Follow along. Pay close attention to the words as we read. An episode of war by Stephen Crane. The lieutenant's rubber blanket lay on the ground, and upon it he had poured the company's supply of coffee. Corporals and other representatives of the grimy and hot-throated men who lined the breastwork had come for each squad's portion. The lieutenant was frowning and serious at this task of division. His lips pursed as he drew with his sword various crevices in the heap, until brown squares of coffee, astoundingly equal in size, appeared on the blanket. He was on the verge of a great triumph in mathematics, and the corporals were thronging forward, each to reap a little square, when suddenly the lieutenant cried out and looked quickly at a man near him, as if he suspected it was a case of personal assault. The others cried out also when they saw blood upon the lieutenant's sleeve. He had winced like a man stung, swayed dangerously, and then straightened. The sound of his hoarse breathing was plainly audible. He looked sadly, mystically, over the breastwork of the green face of a wood, where now were many little puffs of white smoke. During this moment, the men about him gazed statue-like and silent, astonished and awed by this catastrophe, which happened when catastrophes were not expected, when they had leisure to observe it. Our story begins very simply. Crane, the king of understatement. You have a, 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 a soldier, notice it is a lieutenant, who is divvying up coffee for the other soldiers. You get this much, you get this much, you get this much. When all of a sudden, he does one of these numbers and looks around like, dude, what did you just do to me? He's been shot. Very quickly looking up and out of the woods comes lots and lots of these bursts of smoke because more people are shooting. In other words, they've been ambushed and he's been shot. Let's point out for your notes right away at level one, this story starts out so simple and inconsequential. He's doing a mindless activity and all of a sudden he gets wounded in the arm. Now today, if you get shot or wounded in the arm, right, you go to the doctor, they put you under, they go inside with some, med with some uh, instruments, they extract the bullet, and the likelihood is you're, t you're fine. Not during this time. The minute he's wounded, he already knows that saw you saw on the last page of the story will probably be in his future. Question, what would that feel like in your mind to know this is serious business? Let's keep reading now. Go ahead and try and focus and really concentrate on the words. As the lieutenant stared at the wood, they too swung their heads so that for another instant all hands, still silent, contemplated the distant forest as if their minds were fixed upon the mystery of a bullet's journey. The officer had, of course, been compelled to take his sword into his left hand. He did not hold it by the hilt. He gripped it at the middle of the blade awkwardly. Turning his eyes from the hostile wood, he looked at the sword as he held it there and seemed puzzled as to what to do with it, where to put it. In short, this weapon had of a sudden become a strange thing to him. He looked at it in a kind of stupefaction, as if he had been endowed with a trident, a scepter, or a spade. He's going into shock, right? Finally, he tried to sheathe it. To sheathe a sword held by the left hand at the middle of the blade in a scabbard hung at the left hip is a feat worthy of a sawdust ring. This wounded officer engaged in a desperate struggle with the sword and the wobbling scabbard, and during the time of it breathed like a wrestler. But at this instant, the men, the spectators, awoke from their stone-like poses and crowded forward sympathetically. The orderly sergeant took the sword and tenderly placed it in the scabbard. At the time, he leaned nervously backward, 
and did not allow even his finger to brush the body of the lieutenant. A wound gives strange dignity to him who bears it. Well men shy from his new and terrible majesty. It is as if the wounded man's hand is upon the curtain which hangs before the revelations of all existence. The meaning of ants, potentates, wars, cities, sunshine, snow, a feather dropped from a bird's wing, and the power of it sheds radiance upon a bloody form and makes the other men understand sometimes that they are little. His comrades look at him with large eyes thoughtfully. Moreover, they fear vaguely that the weight of a finger upon him might send him headlong, precipitate the tragedy, hurl him at once into the dim gray unknown. And so the orderly sergeant, while sheathing the sword, leaned nervously backward. I'd like to point out a passage that you just read that is going to be, again, emphasizing this naturalism. A wound gives strange dignity to him who bears it. And then all of the things listed that would be part of the way you would normally think. These men are standing looking at this guy and he's kind of wobbly because he took this bullet in his arm. He's going into shock and they're all like, dude, are you like okay? And he's standing there. He's got his, he's got his sword in his other hand. They help him put his sword back into his into its holder, right? But everyone's kind of in awe of what has just transpired. The point here, naturalism, the worst things seem to happen at the very moment you don't expect it, right? I mean, he's got no reason to have imagined that he would have taken a bullet in the arm while he was divvying up coffee for crying out loud. I mean, it's one thing to stand in the middle of the battlefield and everybody walks out on one side and everybody walks out on the other side and uh, firearms get raised 